We have now finished the first portion of our course on, on environmental economics, that is the economics of pollution. And we're about to begin the second portion of our class, which is on natural resource economics. In the first chapter of the natural resource economics portion, chapter 15, is on renewable natural resources. So renewable natural resources are like uh, fish would be an example, and it's going to be the canonical example that we use in this chapter. A resource which could, of course, become extinct if you dry the fish stock to extinction. But in principle, the resource uh, renews itself. This is a more complicated material than environmental economics because it combines biology with economics. And so for the first part of this chapter, we have to learn the basics of what is called biological mechanics or mathematical ecology, which is the way that biologists conceive at the most abstract level of a resource reproducing itself over time, of a species reproducing itself over time. And as I said, the example that I'm going to usually use would be a fish stock. We're thinking of a fish stock in the open ocean, uh, not so much of aquaculture, at least at this stage. So we start with a graph. And the horizontal axis is population size. There are a couple different ways of measuring population size. You can measure it in biomass, so the units would be, let's say, kilograms or metric tons. Or you could measure it by the number of individuals. We're not going to get into these kinds of details in in the biological mechanics. And so I'll usually use individuals, but I could use biomass. I'm going to be uh, vague about which particular measure of the population size I'm using. The vertical axis is going to be, if we, let's say, measure population size in individuals, it'd be individuals per year. And the graphs are going to show births and deaths. And we want to make things as simple as possible. Now, with a larger population size, you get more births and you get more deaths. So we're not talking now about birth rates or death rates. We're talking about the actual number of births and deaths. To, to make things as simple as possible, let's assume that the relationship between population size and births is linear. Now, the relationship of deaths to population size is not going to be linear. And again, the simplest way to model this is as, as a parabola. So here's deaths. Maybe I'll... Uh, put some marks on it so you can see which line the deaths line is. And the notion is when the population size is small, so on the left hand part of this diagram, the species is not pushing very hard on its food supply, so there's ample food. The individuals of the species are not particularly crowded, so you don't have many contagious diseases. Now you might not think of contagious diseases as something that characterizes fish species, but actually fish in the ocean do get contagious diseases, and the closer the fish are together, the more likely they are for the disease to spread. However, on the right-hand side of this diagram, we have the deaths line rising pretty steeply. So here, population size is large, so they're pushing, the species is pushing really hard on its food supply. So you might have pretty easy spread of contagious diseases, and so you get a pretty large amount of deaths. 
what I want to do, what we want to do next <coughs> is draw a graph right underneath this one. with the same horizontal axis, population size, and I want to graph births minus deaths. The easiest place to start is where are births minus deaths equal to zero, that is where does births equal deaths. Well, when the population size is zero, then you have zero births and zero deaths, so births minus deaths are zero. So births minus deaths equals zero when the population size is zero. The other place where births minus deaths are going to be zero is where in the top graph the birth line and the death curve meet, which is here. And so at this level of population, the population size, uh, the, um, the, the births minus deaths is going to be zero. In between these two areas, you can see that the, the births line here is above the deaths line here, and so births minus deaths are positive. So we'll have something that goes roughly like this. And then to the right of the vertical dashed line, that births are here and deaths are higher, so births minus deaths are negative, so this continues. In the simplest case that biologists think about, the births line in the top graph is a straight line, is linear, and the deaths line is a parabola. And if that's the case, then in the bottom, the bottom graph would be exactly a parabola. But for our purposes, it doesn't really matter whether it's exactly a parabola or not. There's an important interpretation of this point here. I'm going to give it some arbitrary numbers just to make things a bit more concrete. So suppose this is a population size of 120. Suppose that the population, and this is 120 here also, suppose that the population starts out being larger than 120. Well then, as you can see in the top graph, the deaths are exceed births, and if deaths exceed births, then the population would shrink. So if you start out above 120, the population is going to go to the left. What if you start below 120? Well, if you start below 120, then births are higher than deaths. If births are higher than deaths, then the population size is increasing. And so if you start out to the left of 120, then the population size increases. So you see that regardless of whether you start to the right of 120 or to the left of 120, as time goes on, you get closer and closer to 120. In, uh, in mathematics of, of uh, nonlinear differential equations, 120 is called an attractor. In biology, the number here that I call 120 is given a symbol, traditionally capital K, and capital K is, the carrying, is called the carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity is capital K. Suppose we're interested in a steady state. So a steady state is a situation where the population size is unchanging. I claim that we can interpret, for example, the number 70 in the following manner. <clears throat> 
Suppose the population size is 70, then this point here represents the births minus deaths when the population size is 70. Suppose that's, I don't know, suppose that's equal to 4. Now, think about humans intervening in this ecosystem and catching fish. Suppose humans caught four fish per year. And by the way, the vertical axis, I wrote it as births minus de deaths, but it's births minus deaths per year. And you know the number four might be four tons or four million tons. It's not literally four fish. So if the population size started out as 70, and people caught four fish per year, then I claim that the population size at the end of the year is going to be 70, just like it was at the beginning of the year. Because basically, so at the beginning of the year, you started with 70 individuals. Then excess births, which is births minus deaths, excess or four and if the so-called fishing harvest or catch is also four then essentially the first four would bring you from 70 to the population from 70 to 74 but the second one decreases it back down to 70 and so you end up with it exactly the same population you started with. And therefore, you're in a steady state where the population size hasn't changed because the fishing harvest was exactly the same as the excess births, as the births minus deaths. And so this gives this point a new interpretation. This point tells you that if you start at uh, stock size of 70, so population size and stock size means the same thing, population size, stock size. If you start at a stock size of, of 70, then the number 4 represents the amount of harvest that humans can take from this ecosystem and stay in a steady state. So the number four then is also called the sustainable yield. And this graph of births minus deaths per year is therefore also a graph of sustainable yield. Suppose we were interested in achieving maximum sustainable yield. Maximum sustainable yield is often abbreviated MSY. Well, we, we have a sustainable yield graph. That's, that's this graph. So the question is, what's the maximum on that graph? And of course, the maximum on this graph is right at the peak. So I claim that this value, uh, maybe it's equal to 60, will generate the maximum sustainable yield. And the maximum sustainable yield itself will be the height. So this value here is maximum sustainable yield. And the 60 is the stock size, stock size that generates maximum sustainable yield. And by the way, all of you guys have heard about sustainability. The term sustainability started to be used in the general sense that you're used to it beginning in the 1980s. Before that, the word sustainability was only used 
in actually this context, in the context of renewable resources, where we talked about sustainable yield and maximum sustainable yield. The last thing I want to note is that how much effort people put into the fishery is sometimes called fishing effort. And let's think about how you would graph, or I get not necessarily literally graph, but get some idea of fishing effort on, on the second graph. Well, if fishing effort were zero, then humans aren't getting any fish. And if humans aren't getting any fish, then you'd stay here at the carrying capacity. So the carrying capacity, because that's the, where the, the natural environment goes to. So the carrying capacity is what you'd get if you had zero fishing effort. Now if you start getting more fishing effort, then of course you get less fish. And what that means, the less fish means going to the left, which means that if you move to the left on this graph, that corresponds to a higher fishing effort. Okay, so that's all we have for this graph for right now. We'll continue in the next video.